Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm Audrey Bilger. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Pomona College. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all here this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce one of our faculty members who will be interviewing Mohsin Hamid tonight. And then they'll be saying a lot more about, about our honored guest, Arash. Kazani is Pomona College Professor of History and Coordinator of Middle Eastern Studies, and he'll be in conversation this evening with our guest, Mohsin Hamid. Professor Kazani has been with the college for the past eight years. In his research, he examines the imperial and environmental histories of the early modern and colonial Middle East, Central Asia, and South Asia. Among his publications are Sky Blue Stone, The Turquoise Trade in World History, and the prize-winning Tribes and Empire on the Margins of 19th Century Iran, which was honored by the Middle East Studies Association in 2010. He's recently finished a book manuscript on Indo-Persian travels and travel writing on Southeast Asia entitled The City and the Wilderness, under contract with the University of California Press. A piece of this research, Colonial Persian on the Margins of the Mughal World, will be appearing as an article in the Oxford Journal, Past and Present, in the spring of 2019. Professor Kazani is an expert on environmental history, empire, and imperialism, and Middle Eastern and world history, all of which we see the importance and effects of every day in the news. Please join me in welcoming our honored guest, Mohsin Hamid and Professor Arash Kazani. Thank you. How many novelists does it take to uh, use a microphone? Um, well, with stars, I think uh, there's a few different things. On the one hand, uh, you know, stars are um, an incredible instance of uh, time travel that we experience every day. Um, you know, when we see stars, what we're seeing is light that was emitted, in some cases, years or even centuries ago. And so um, the twinkle of that particular star tonight is a twinkle that may have emerged, um, you know, when Columbus was arriving in America or when Rumi was writing his poems. Um, and so uh, stars are quite a wonderful and very prosaic phenomenon. Um, our relationship to this planet uh, and, and you know, a sense of wonder uh, comes from the stars. And there was a wonderful documentary I saw, I think called uh, Dark City, perhaps, um, about how as light has become more common, our relationship uh, to the stars has been partially severed. And until recently, people would look up at the sky and feel this sense of awe and insignificance in the face of the stars, and now we barely see them. Um, but I suppose the, the other thing which I really like about, about the stars as a jumping off point is, um, the Sufis tell us that there's, I guess, two different directions in which one achieves transcendence or enlightenment. Um, one is that you look out at the stars. Uh, at the universe, 
and you see reflected in it yourself. Um, and the other one is that you look inside yourself and you see reflected within you the universe. Um, and I think, I think in that sense, you know, we are made from stardust and, uh, and our relationship to this thing far away uh, sets up, I guess, a lot of the things that, I've, that I care about uh, in my fiction. In many instances in the novel, um, the, the brightness of the sky is the inverse of the, of the darkness of Earth. And then there's also moments where, interestingly enough, cell phones are used to understand the stars as well and, and to kind of comprehend the, the cosmos. I, we have an, I have an app on my phone. Um, I, cell phones are so weird, actually, I, I think before we talk about the app. Um, technology is weird. Uh, I think it is, it is possible for us to imagine that technology is not weird, um, but that this is a mistake. And to continually renew our sense of the weirdness of technology is very important. And if we are to renew our sense of the weirdness of technology, we, we need to speak of technology not in the language of technology, but in a different language. And so in the novel, um, in a way, uh, this is a novel where people have phones. Um, but, uh, but more even than phones, I think um, we, at this moment in this room, uh, probably every single one of us is carrying on our person or in a bag a hopefully silenced black rectangle, you know, which, is the, which is the screen of our phone. And we have a very strange relationship to this thing. Um, you know, it calls out to us. And we touch it in our pockets. And we look at it constantly. And if it is taken from us, you know, we suffer powerful withdrawal. I was telling some students today that I often think that our phones are like the ring and the Lord of the Rings. You know, and we're, we're all Gollum, you know, sort of saying, my precious. And, um, and, and this strange black rectangle that we carry with us has among uh, it features um, the capacity to obliterate distance. We send our consciousness through this black rectangle and we are suddenly uh, reading about uh, Russian history or the surface of Mars or the backstory of characters in Westeros. And, um, and as we do this, as we decouple our consciousness from the physical location of our bodies, um, there's something very interesting happening. Um, technology is enabling us to transcend physical distance. And so, in some senses, the novel uh, Exit West, uh, with its black rectangles, is a response to this, the little black rectangles that are all around us and the effect of technology that we see. Um, but if we want to understand what all this is doing to us, um, to remember how weird it all is, and to think about the human uh, emotional side of it is very important and so um, uh, I, I like the idea of not ever using the language of technology to describe technology so you know if you say I have an iPhone 7 and it you know runs OS 10 and I've got these apps you're speaking a kind of nonsense you know gibberish um, uh, but if you say this summer in Greece um, my children were amazed by how bright the stars were and how the same ones seem to pop up over the horizon at a particular time. And so I looked through my black rectangle up at them and I was able to tell my children the names of these things and their movements. And we began to be able to watch them uh, and thereby access a relationship to this past that we hadn't previously had. Then something interesting starts to happen. And, um, and in this novel, um, because it is a novel about technology, uh, about our moment and about being human, which is to do with technology. Uh, uh, yes, the, the cell phone is, is uh, very strongly present uh, in all of it. At one point um, in the novel you write, the news in those days was full of... Uh, the, <laughs> the news in those days was full of war and migrants and nativists, and it was full of fracturing too, of regions pulling away from nations and cities pulling away from hinterlands. And it seemed that as everyone was coming together, everyone was also moving apart. 
Without borders, nations appear to be becoming somewhat illusory. How does this passage capture your views of cities, nations, migration, and the very idea of a place called home in our tough times? My goodness. Um, I can answer that in 30 seconds or less. Uh, no, I think you know, what you've touched upon there are so many of the themes that are really at the heart of this book and of what I'm trying to do and what my writing is concerned with. Um, I'll try to untangle some of those themes. You know, when you speak of a sense of home, um, you know, I think that home uh, is, is uh, in a sense, a kind of illusion for all of us. Uh, those of you who are students here who are not from um, this immediate part of Los Angeles will have come here from somewhere. And in my experience, when you return to that somewhere, even if it's just a visit, when you complete your studies here, you will find that that place has changed and you will have a very strange experience of going back to a place and looking at it with slightly foreign eyes. Um, and, and the weird thing about this is it might have happened to you uh, even if you never went to university and you'd stayed where you were, because as you get older, the places around you seem to change. Um, Lahore looks different to me than when I was a child, but of course I've moved away from Lahore and come back. And so I think we are all in a way, um, grappling with a continual loss of and search for home. Um, you know, migration is for me the fundamental nature of human existence. Each of us is present in this moment, and now this moment, and the previous moment is gone, and we lose that moment. We can never return to that moment. And as we move through time, our experience is of a continual series of losses, tiny losses, but they become, over a lifetime, significant. You know, we lose the elementary school we used to play in, um, the person who sold us ice cream, uh, the friends who disperse, you know, our parents, our loved ones. And over the course of a life, um, we lose everything. And so, and so this notion of us being temporal beings, moving from one island in time to the next island in time, uh, uh, I think is, 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 is what people are. So home in such an environment is a very hard thing to imagine. Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, where can we go to find it? It can't just be a place. It can't be a moment. Um, it might be... Uh, more of, um, of an attitude, uh, a stance, than a location. And, uh, but I think also, uh, because of home and because of migration through time, uh, wonderful things become possible for us. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we have a choice as to whether or not we wish to acknowledge within ourselves the feeling of loss that we are continually experiencing. We're encouraged to not acknowledge this, to imagine that um, we're not feeling the sorrow of losing the people we love, of losing our youth, um, and to just go about life as normal. Um, but I think in doing so, and denying ourselves the compassion of acknowledging what we lose all the time, by suppressing that compassion for our own loss, we wind up foreclosing our ability to have compassion for others. And so when we see somebody arrive in a place, a migrant, a geographic migrant, a refugee, they bring with them a reminder of what we have lost and what we have closed ourselves off to. And in a sense, it's very difficult for us to extend them compassion because we haven't done the same to ourselves. So. I think that it, it, it's, it's essential to consider um, that each of us is looking for home. We've all lost it. We continually lose it. Um, and yet this enables us to see each other and, and, to, and to be seen and to be recognized. And it makes possible beauty and hope and optimism. Um, and, and it requires a degree of, of courage, I think. you know. Um, as someone once said, you know, growing old is not for sissies. Um, uh, you know, none of us gets out of this alive. Um, and so, and so um, extending to ourselves and then to others 
uh, a recognition of the heartache and heartbreak of, of, of migration um, is, I think, one of the steps towards just a different relationship of humanity to itself. And, and all of the migrants who've moved around the world, who continually move around the world, come to us bearing the potential for this future where we do acknowledge that we are all migrants. And by doing so, we make possible actually a much better world because so much of our discourse today is about how we lose things when people come where we are. Um, but we, great, we gain perhaps much more than, than, than we lose. And uh, you know, the last thing on, on this that uh, I guess I'd like to say is that um, you know, when, we, um, when we think about ourselves as natives, and we imagine that we are native to a place. Um, that nobody is native to a place. There are people who have been uh, perhaps the first people, descended from the first people to come to a place. But, but no one is native to a place in the sense that we've all, our ancestors have come from somewhere else and we are at a fundamental, um, in a fundamental sense, not native to this moment in which we find ourselves. We have never been here before. And we also can't stay here. And so um, uh, I guess reestablishing the, the centrality of transience as what a human life consists of, that permanence is not possible, we cannot stay put. Home can be a prison, but it certainly is not something we can actually touch and see on a you know, daily basis. Um, better to have it as a feeling. Uh, I think is I think is is for me um, uh, 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 very important and 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 because of this narrative is also very important because how do we take these moments and string them together how do we take this constant experience of loss these discrete experiences of loss and make something continuous a life out of it and that's where narrative comes in and and, and among narratives is of course storytelling on this point of uh, loss and narrative there's a really striking passage when you say that when we migrate, we murder from our lives those we left behind. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I live, I live these days back in Pakistan. I live next door to my parents, and every day in the morning my kids play with their grandparents. And sometimes I think, what if terrible events were to befall Pakistan and I would, I would have to leave? Uh, and I, I imagine that leaving my parents, who have now you know, become older and uh, love having their grandparents next door, uh, their grandchildren next door, um, I do think there would be a certain emotional violence to leaving, which doesn't mean that one shouldn't leave. Under certain circumstances, one must leave. Um, but, but the emotional violence of severing day-to-day -day loving relationships is, is an intense one. Uh, and it's important to highlight this because I think the way in which we repress our own knowledge of the emotional violence of the constant separations we have experienced tends to show up in other ways. We see it across generations of immigrants where that violent rupture with the place that was even voluntarily left and the people who were in that place expresses itself you know, from one generation to the next um, can be found you know, uh, uh, echoing. Um, you find it in you know, America, for example, where the national narrative is of coming to this place the frontier, you know, going. Um, and yet, of course, uh, the narrative of America is also very much leaving people behind, you know, to come here. And America is founded on, you know, in that sense, two great sorrows. Um, the great sorrow that was inflicted upon people who were here. Uh, uh, and also the great sorrow that was experienced by those who left where they were to come here. Um, and when we don't talk about those things and we, um, uh, we don't acknowledge uh, the real emotional violence that is involved, um, we set ourselves up to uh, be kind of deaf to its echoes. Um, why this anger? You know, why this violence? Where do these things come from? Uh, why the dehumanization of other people? Um, because uh, a dehumanization of ourselves also occurs. And, and again, this is not to say we shouldn't migrate. I, mean, I think migration is, is what we do geographically as, as a species. All species do it. 
but um, we need to reckon with the price that we pay. And it's also worth saying that, you know, when we think about a refugee, and sometimes people say, a migrant or refugee has come to a place like America, you know, what have they given? What have they done to earn this? And the answer, of course, has to be they have given everything. You know, they've given their parents, their loved ones, their uh, food, their language, their music, their architecture, they've given up all of it uh, and come. And, and, and that, the, the emotional scale of that uh, violence, both as a sacrifice made and as a pain suffered, um, to me, uh, shows up far too rarely in how we discuss uh, what this is all about. And on some level, many of, these, uh, many of these themes that we're talking about are about globalization and the, and the connections it creates, fragile threads that, that link our world together. Um, but it seems that through those connections, there also comes a heightening sense of difference. I think we were just talking about that. How does Exit West render these alternate experiences of global cosmopolitanism on the one hand and alienation of, of, of belonging and being a citizen of the world on the one hand and, and feeling left out in the course of our migrations on the other? Um, you know, th these, these two things are happening simultaneously. So um, uh, uh, people, at any given moment, people can feel uh, left out of these changes or have it, uh, these changes are occurring to them. Um, uh, or they can feel they are authoring these changes in some way in their own lives. But um, I think that in the novel, the way I try to tackle this particular notion, the idea that there are seven billion ways of regarding migration at any given moment, one for each of us and maybe more than one for each of us. Um, in the novel, the way I tried to do this was to uh, I guess have a kind of pointillist technique where you know, there's these little micro stories that occur. So we follow Seyd and Nadi as they go from their original starting city to Greece, to London, to Marin County here in California. But um, we also encounter these little very small stories of just a page or two. Um, and, and these stories are of somebody, of other people who have no direct connection to say the Nadia, some of whom might fear uh, migration or might have experienced it differently or might be angry about it or might unexpectedly find beauty in it. Um, and the idea of, of, of doing this was through these very small stories that explore migration in different ways. Um, like in a pointless painting, there are these little dots of color and if you look closely you see dots, but when you step away it becomes an image. Um, you know, and, and uh, for, I guess, the majority of this uh, audience, it's like, you know, pixels on a screen. If you look closely at pixels on a screen, you see little dots, but when you, discrete, separate dots, and, but when you move away, um, you see something continuous, you see you know, an image. Um, and so these micro stories were meant to be pixels um, that, that become a continuous picture of the world through the imagination of the reader, uh, and I think that's, in a way, what, what novels, uh, uh, for me, do. Um, a novel is, uh, as written, is only a half novel. Um, we writers write half novels that consist of letters and spaces and punctuation marks. Um, but readers don't really experience that. Readers experience characters and feelings and images. Um, and the way that readers experience that is that readers create, out of their own imagination, all of those things prompted by the letters and punctuation marks and spaces that, that we writers make. And so a novel is an invitation to readers to co-create. And in this novel, those, those little dots, those little pixels of story, are an invitation to the reader to co-create the world that we all live in, that say the Nadia are inhabiting, to fill it out um, and, uh, and, to, and to create a larger picture of, of what the reader feels um, is going on. Building on that, what, what truths uh, can fictional works tell us about the real world? Well, um, put down this glass of uh, this water. Um, uh, well, I guess the, the first thing I would say about this is uh, 
what we often call reality doesn't actually exist, right? So, I mean, we are sitting, you and I, uh, theoretically on this, you know, stage, and this is a, you know, wooden solid table, but we know that this is not actually a solid wooden table. This is a mostly an expanse of empty space with some atoms scattered across it and much more space between those atoms than, than the actual atoms themselves. Yet we perceive it as a table. And I think this table is kind of brown. But it isn't actually brown. There may not be any such thing as brown. What is happening is light is reflecting off this table at particular wavelengths. There are receptors in my eyes that relay this to my brain. My brain creates an experience which I call brown. Um, and that's this, right? Uh, there's a scene in The Matrix where uh, they're talking about how, you know, uh, 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 that, the, that we're tasting this gruel. And, uh, uh, and he's, one of them is asking, you know, how do we know what this thing tastes like? How do the machines know what this tastes like? Maybe this gruel really tastes like what tuna fish tasted like. But we've just been programmed to think this is what, you know, uh, this, this cereal tastes like. Similarly, we don't know you know, if, you, if we all see this brown in the same way, if you know, maybe what I see as brown, you guys see as the taste of tuna fish, it's very hard to, um, to have any way of figuring that out. Um, and this is not just that physics is weird, because physics is weird. It is also that um, now the table isn't solid, the brown isn't really brown, but also who is speaking? Like, who am I? Um, that's an interesting question, because you know, think about in day-to-day -day life, you'll go about doing stuff. I mean, I think I'm a nice guy, I'm a writer, you know, I'm a dad. My friend Dave is in the audience. And like, I have a whole story about, you know, who I am. But, um, uh, but then sometimes I'll behave terribly. I'll be nasty, I'll be rude, I'll be, un you know, unkind. And I'll think, oh, I wasn't myself. You know, I can't believe, you know, that happened. It's so on me. But I was myself. It's just the story I tell myself isn't true. Right? Uh, of course I was myself when I did that nasty thing. Of course I was myself, myself when I behave in ways that seem unacceptable to me. It's, it's the narrative I tell about myself that was revealed to be false. And, and we spend our whole lives basically creating ourselves through story. You know, we each um, are a story we tell about ourselves to ourselves. And we're inventing this story all the time. Um, sometimes when something really traumatic or radical occurs in our life, uh, the story begins to fall apart. And then we struggle to reassert a sense of our identity or to situate ourselves in our lives because our story doesn't work anymore and we find that in the absence of our story, we don't really have anything else. So, um, you know, the physical world is pretty weird. We are kind of made up stories that we tell ourselves. And, um, you know, and then uh, uh, if we talk about, you know, what can fiction do and what can writing do in this context, like what is the role of writing? Um, uh, Nonfiction, fiction. Well, I think that um, uh, it is human nature to enter into worlds of imagination. Um, when you're figuring out who you are as a kid, you are also trying on identities that are rather removed um, from what your adult identity hopefully is going to be. So my son, for example, likes to be a T-Rex. And he's six, and he will come into my study at the end of my writing day. Well, this is what makes my writing day end. He comes in, he bangs on the door, and he sort of t comes in, his arms are tucked in, he leans forward, he lets this very, you know, blood-curdling roar, the veins on the side of his neck stand out. He stomps forward on two heavy legs, looks at me, the lumbering, weak, herbivorous, you know, uh, stooped over keyboard dinosaur that I am, and moves in for the kill. Now, and he stomps so heavily, and, and in this moment, you know, Vali, my son, he is Vali, but he is this dinosaur. It's complete commitment. I don't think he's, you know, pretending to be a dinosaur, really. He, he, as far as he's concerned, is one. Uh, and I feel my heart beating faster as he closes in. And, you know, uh, uh, there, there, you know there's something going on. And um, now that, that we try on these fictional constructs as children, um, what is 
perhaps more interesting is how many of us seem to be told that we don't need to keep doing this when we grow up. Some of us choose to continue to live our lives um, you know, professionally inhabiting made, you know, made up worlds and creating made up worlds. Uh, but some of us um, choose to not do this and we daydream, um, but also we encounter fiction. And when we encounter fiction, we receive an invitation to enter once again into a made up world. Now, remember what I said about you know, this table being made up and our story about ourselves being partly fictional. When the fictional story that we call a self enters into the act of reading a book, i.e. enters into a fictional world, it can relax, right? The whole pretense of pretending that everything is true and that this is not partly made up can go away. We can sort of chill. Our fictional, semi-fictional you know, lives selves in the process of reading a book um, I think become kind of comfortable they can put their feet up and and so uh, uh, and and what then happens is something you know truly astounding you know when you're reading a novel when you're reading a story of reading you know a, a, a book um, you are by yourself all alone and you are containing within yourself your thoughts, but also somebody else's thoughts, right? And who are you in that moment? You're still you, sitting there by yourself, but the writer in some weird way or this particular story is also inside you. Are you yourself? Are you the writer? Are you some weird hybrid of the two? If you can be some weird hybrid of the two, what does it mean you really are? Um, you know, it's weird stuff. And, um, and so uh, it's an incredibly fertile, position. Everything is destabilized. We are sitting in this very strange predicament where our self is reading this thing and we are alone and it is inside us and we are imagining and something is going on. And, um, and I think that is important because um, we require our imagination and we require a degree of flexibility and flux. Um, to figure stuff out, you know? Uh, we need to imagine better ways of being, and we need to imagine different ways of living, and we need to imagine solutions to the sorrows and terrors and everything that we face. And so for me, you know, what fiction does in this context is it sets this stuff up. Um, we, uh, we will not get to futures that we desire if we can't articulate stories of what they might look like. Right? And so, how do we do that? Um, how do we get to uh, uh, these things? And I think, for me, that is one of the things that fiction does, is it allows us to, to transcend um, the notion of the self to a certain extent, allows us to play make-believe as adults, allows us as readers to author an imaginative experience, to co-author it with writers, um, and, and then makes possible things that weren't possible before. Because as we go through these experiences and we feel things and we experience things, we emerge the other end um, with our stories a bit changed. And then as our stories change, new things become possible. And you know, that is why human beings, since as far as we know, have used stories to figure out you know, not just where they've been, but uh, where they're going. Thank you for that. That's just reminiscent of something that, that comes up again and again. It's just that writing actually sort of produces a kind of a reality. It doesn't actually just capture it or represent it, but brings it into creation. Um, if we can talk a little bit more about writing, I'd like to just come back to the, the various interpolated stories and asides in the novel. Um, Exit West is really intricately structured and I was just wondering if you could say a little more about the literary and thematic purpose of these shorter asides, which you've already referred to, uh, these different side stories in the book, um, these doors in time in places like Australia, Japan, Africa, Southern California, um, and how, how these scenes relate to Nadia and Said's story and the novel overall. Well, um, the... I wanted the book to be small. And the reason why is 
I, I quite like, I don't think books need to be small, so my famous, favorite books are enormous, but, but I quite like operating um, with an imaginary notion that um, this could be happening along a, around a log fire and we are telling a story and it could happen in one sitting. You know, you could begin reading the novel at lunch and be done by dinner um, with a couple breaks maybe along the way. Um, not that you need to read the novel in a single uninterrupted sitting, but that it is built to make that possible. Um, you know, when we build novels, there's a kind of architecture that goes into building the novel, and that architecture uh, corresponds to a kind of imaginary journey through the, through the building. But then once a novel is built, you don't have to walk through the building that way. You can walk through it anyway. But you need, as a writer, I think, some, some sense of what, you know, what journey is the, uh, the journey being used to design the thing. And for me, you know, the idea that it could be read in one sitting um, uh, is, is part of that. Um, it means it's a small book. Also because so many people I meet in Pakistan and my friends don't really read novels. Uh, very, you know, certainly what we call in quotes, you know, literary fiction. Um, uh, literary fiction al almost sort of means the stuff that people I know don't read, you know. And, uh, 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 but even novels generally. And so um, partly writing small books um, is a response to that. Like start this, you might like it, you might finish it before you even know, you know that you were doing it. And um, now how to write a small book uh, but about big stuff like the whole world changing. Um, then what begins to happen is I think you know you have to figure out um, an aesthetic uh, and a you know variety of techniques, uh, an aesthetic of efficiency and a variety of techniques around compression and decompression, right? So, how you know when you listen to music, you know an MP3 or whatever uh, download, MP3 is I guess are very dated now, but whatever format you're listening to your music on, um, when you listen to digital music, what's happened is that something an algorithm has compressed that digital music into a little file. It comes to the thing you're listening to it on. It's decompressed and played back as sound waves. Um, and somewhere along the way, it, it went from these curves of sound to these little steps of digital compression back to curves. Um, and, and we are constantly, uh, I think, expanding our ability to compress and decompress stuff. So today, uh, we have available to us, I think, as writers and readers, a whole bunch of um, modes of compression and decompression that weren't available a couple hundred years ago. Um, you know, the idea that you could just stop a scene and then pick up later, and whatever happened in the interim, the audience is sort of comfortable making that leap with you. This is a kind of cinematic televisual cut, um, which we writers benefit from, or the, the, the excellence of the essay, um, which means that we are quite comfortable now encountering in essayistic form lots of stories, you know. In other words, that you can, um, if the old dictum was, you know, show, don't tell, you know, now it's, you know, tell if you save some space. And so, um, you know, show if it feels like a particularly nice thing to show. And, uh, and so it's possible to do this stuff. These little, little micro stories were a way of doing that, of, of having small things expand. But I guess all of this is in the context of, you know, what, what the hell is the novel supposed to do? Like, what is this thing? What kind of novel is this? And when I started writing my first novel, Mott Smoke, I wrote, um, at a, you know, having come out of a Pakistan that was, um, you know, ruled by a tyrannical dictator named Zawal Haq, who sought to Islamize, you know, Pakistan, and Pakistan is sort of 90 plus percent Muslim, so how do you further Islamize, you know, uh, a place that's vastly Muslim already? Um, it meant, you know, outlawing dance and, um, you know, busting kids who got on dates and, you know, uh, uh, it wasn't fun. Uh, and, and so the notion that we were all these pure characters living in this life that was being sort of shoved down our throats by people in power, it seemed to me I desperately needed to write about deeply flawed characters um, who were all lying. Uh, and Mott Smoke was sort of that. 
But today, we live in a world where the most powerful people in the world tell us that uh, nothing is true um, and people uh, cannot behave decently. And so I thought I needed to write a novel which says exactly what it means about people who are trying to be decent. Like that felt to me like a, like a radical response to this moment. And then I thought, well, what is a novel? You know, because all of my other novels have been based on um, a destabilized relationship between the reader and the, and the story. Like, you know, you know that what, the way this thing is being told isn't quite right. Like, how to get filthy rich in rising Asia isn't really a guide to getting filthy rich in rising Asia, but it's pretending to be, and it kind of is, but kind of isn't. And Thrakton Fundamentalist, you know, is Chinggis telling a story to you, presumably an American stranger who doesn't get to speak back, but is that what's really going on? And so each of those novels were, I suppose, trying to be honest by putting up front um, the fact that, you know, this is, this is an unstable situation. You need to interpret this for yourself. But now I thought um, I wanted to write a book that sort of built the decoder ring of the book into the book that sort of said what it meant. Um, and, and then when I thought, how do I do this? You know, what books that I like do this? Um, I immediately thought of children's literature. And I thought, you know, like Charlotte's Web does this. And sort of The Wind in the Willows does this. And, um, you know, and how do they do it, right? And then I was thinking, okay, well, what, what, is, this, what is the form? Um, and, and, I, and I began to believe that, that this form is a kind of, uh, like a, a double partisan um, position of the narrator. And what I mean by that is, in a children's book, you know, in Anna Karenina, I'm not gonna give away the ending, but, um, uh, but in Anna Karenina, right, um, the novel is kind of neutral as to what happens to Anna at the end. Um, the novel isn't screaming, you know, no, Anna, don't, well, go to that station, let's say. And, um, uh, but in Charlotte's Web, you know, it's, it's, the novel is screaming at us, you know, Wilbur, don't die. Um, so in children's books, very often, what we see is that the, the narrative stance is not neutral. It's cheering for the character. And that was, for me, very interesting. Um, but also, the, the double partisan nature is it's cheering for you, the reader. It's saying you are on the team of Charlotte and Wilbur. Like, it's you, Charlotte and Wilbur, reader. It's, it's, it's not, that's Charlotte and Wilbur, I'm cheering for them. You, you know, reader, uh, deal with my, you know, dismantling of the gap between reader and writer. It's, it's, it's their Charlotte and Wilbur and us, you know, you. We're all on this team. Um, and, and I thought that, you know, that's, that for me became the way I approached this book, which is the narrator would be this kind of omniscient position that can zoom up to the cosmic, come down into any character's point of view, sort of just where it goes, where it wants to go, wherever needed. It can flip for no apparent reason to other people's lives. But, but the narrator of this novel is on, say, the Nadia's side. And also on the reader's side. It's not going to be a fast one. It's not that you're going to figure out later, oh, the narrator really meant this and I fell for that. Or, um, it was, the, you know, the narrator is basically trying to say what the narrator means and, and saying that you are with us on this one. Um, and that for me, I mean, it may not sound that strange to uh, many of you in this room, but for me it was a very weird way to write, uh, you know, this kind of double partisan position. And, um, and then it dictated so many things that followed, like uh, a lot of the structure of the book and the tone. All of that then came from this thing that the book would be cheering for its characters and cheering for the reader as part of the team and saying what it means and having people try to be decent, above all, uh, engage in the most difficult task that any of us faces, which is how to let go well. Uh, and I think that is uh, uh, sort of the, I guess, the, the children's book inheritance of, of the whole thing. So maybe continuing on that aspect of style and genre um, in the work, your, your first novel, Moth Smoke, uh, began with a, a kind of a framing story 
a, a prophetic Sufi tale about the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan and the war of secession between his four sons at the end of his reign. The main character is named Dara, after Dara Shikul, uh, the philosopher prince that, that didn't rise to the throne. Um, and so, turning to Exit West, with all these different strands and vignettes that we've been talking about, its ways of narration, its fluidity and movement, I was wondering if, if it's in any way influenced by non-Western forms of storytelling, uh, such as, for instance, the South Asian genre of the Dastan, which does allow this kind of elevation and moving from place to place. I mean, it's often discussed in terms of magical realism, and you brought up pointillism a, a, a moment ago. But I was just wondering, how, how does the novel possibly engage different methods and styles of storytelling together that may come from a different kind of context altogether, a different genre altogether? I, I guess the short answer is I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to, uh, to figure out where we get stuff from. I mean, when, I, when I'm aware of what it is, I can, I can talk to it, but oftentimes stuff is around and we absorb it. So, I mean, I grew up in a household where people would listen to Kavali and listen to sort of Sufi ghazals, and, you know, my wife is a classical South Asian singer, and so she sings, you know, this kind of uh, and folk and, and classical, and, um, and so it's around. Um, how is it, like, deployed is very hard for me to say. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I've, I'm, I'm very interested in the notion that traditional forms of helping us cope with change and impermanence are being weakened. That as religion becomes partisan in out group dynamics and politicized, it no longer functions as well to help us cope with the universal predicament of being mortal human beings. As families are displaced by distance, they too are less able to do this. But not just distance, but by the demands on their time of a relentless, uh, you know, economic system that uh, that values time spent by family members together uh, uh, almost not at all, um, and and that imposes upon us such a desperate uh, uh, sort of predicament where we don't have the time we used to have, you know, for people we love. And uh, uh, so the family, the religion, you know, folk culture, et cetera, by movement, migration, um, the pace of change is accelerating. So the, the gap between generations grows wider. So many of the old, you know, the older mechanisms we had to deal with change and to deal with loss and to deal with impermanence are growing weaker. And so we need to articulate new mechanisms or need to newly articulate old mechanisms um, to deal with this, and I think we need to do it in ways that are open to everyone and that don't, um, that don't limit themselves to people of a particular religious or non-religious tradition. Like we have to speak about the stuff that we used to think of as being spiritual stuff, and maybe some of us still think of as spiritual stuff, in terms that is open to all human beings to participate in the conversation. And, and so, you know, what is this stuff, right? What can we muster? Uh, and bring into this space. Um, because if we don't deal with it, what happens is we live in an, in an environment where um, our attention is being monetized um, and there is a war, an economic war for our attention. Uh, and our attention, because of the way our organism is designed, goes towards frightening stuff. You know, if you walk around this campus every day for a year and every day 10 people say hi to you, and and once in that year somebody makes a threatening or racist comment to you, you might not remember a single one of those 3,000 hellos, but you might remember that racist or threatening comment for the rest of your life. And the reason for that is because you're, you're designed that way. You know, our ancestors who looked in the trees and saw a flash of orange and said, that probably isn't a tiger, got eaten, you know, and they didn't pass on their DNA to us. And so we are descended from the folks who said, that might be a tiger, run for your life. And, um, and so, and so um, because we, we privilege threatening information so much more than unthreatening information, when there's a war for our attention as is currently occurring in our technological media environment, the stuff we're being given to get our attention is scary stuff. 
you know, disproportionately, we're not being told that today in Pakistan, you know, 833,000 people kissed their kid goodnight and 62,000 people wrote their first poem and, you know, a million kids, like, practiced riding the bike. We are told that, like, these eight folks were trying to kill us. Um, and, and we pay attention to that. So we are continuously seeing on all of the different screens that we possess um, information that suggests that we are utterly threatened. And we are developing a completely disconnected relationship between what degree of threat is out there and our hyper-anxious state. And in this hyper-anxious state, we uh, come to believe that the future is terrifying, and so therefore we uh, respond naturally by privileging the past, and we virtually invite uh, peddlers of nostalgic political nonsense uh, to come and tell us that, you know, if we go back to the caliphate of a thousand years ago or to Britain before, you know, joined the European Union or America, you know, in the 50s and 60s, that things are going to be fantastic. Of course, we can't go back to those things. And we probably wouldn't want to. We shouldn't want to because it wasn't great back then. Um, but we are so frightened of the future because of the deg degree of fear we're being set that we are, you know, desperately off keel. So, how do we deal with all of this? Well, we have to uh, engage in this process of figuring out what is going to be the way in which we master this fear, that we figure out how to navigate this environment, that we reestablish a sense of what a human life is for and how it is to be lived. And these kinds of questions we should have as a human collective and not as you know, just the Muslims talking to the Muslims, because the Muslims aren't the Muslims. I mean, there's two billion people who believe all kinds of different stuff. So, um, so I think you know, in, in, that, uh, in that kind of a, a, a context, um, uh, for me it's really interesting to see you know, what fiction can do and what the novel can do. And of course, because in Pakistan today, the most popular writers are Sufi poets who've been dead for centuries. And you can go to a shrine of a poet and 10,000 people will be there on a Friday night you know, uh, singing and chanting and listening and um, uh, out of veneration for what some poet said about transcendence and love centuries ago. Um, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, take that, uh, you know, New York Times top 10 book list. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's like uh, uh, we, you know, the, the, um, the societal need and veneration for what writing can actually do is profound, right? It's not a marketing thing. Uh, it's not like me and my 10 friends deciding what book I like. It's, it's you know, over centuries, people thinking this adds value to their lives. Um, and now, that's not that any one of our books or any one of us as writers will necessarily do this, but collectively, we are all engaged in this project together. And, and, so, and so then, you know, uh, what traditions does one bring? I think an awareness of that tradition definitely informs what I write. And the stuff that we can learn from is things, you know, like whether you consider it to be a Sufi notion or like a Jewish mystical notion, sort of Martin Buber talks about an I-thou relationship that, that blurs the boundary between you know, the self and, and, and the Sufis talk about the love between you know, the divine and the, and, and the self or between the beloved and the self, blurring the notion of the self. Um, and if you love in the right way, um, you aren't so imprisoned within yourself. And therefore, the impending end of yourself is not the end of everything. And life can be better uh, lived in that knowledge. Uh, and there's so many of the simple things, you know, uh, whether it's a kind of meditative tradition that will tell you that, you know, if you are able to understand the present moment, you are freed of the tyranny of the past and the future. Um, all this stuff is out there. And there are many more. Uh, I mean, it's just, these are just two sort of random uh, examples of, of these older wisdoms. Uh, but I think, yeah, uh, you know, what influences and, and what mechanisms do I concern myself with? It's this stuff. Um, but, but really, uh, uh, in, I guess, a globalized sense to say, like, all of this is the shared heritage of every human being on this planet. And we should share it and discuss it in a way that's open to everybody. Brilliant. Um, I have one more question, I think, building on that theme of love, and then we'll go to uh, our student questions. Um, what is the role of the love story of Nadia and Saeed? These are the only characters with names. Um, what role does their relationship do as a, as a sort of 
central structuring device of the novel. What sort of a love story is this? Well, you know, Nadia and Said's love uh, is the story of a first love. And, um, uh, and, you know, we call something a first love because there was a second love, right? If, <laughs> if, if there wasn't, it would just have been a love, right? Uh, like, this is the love of my life. This is not the first love of my life. Uh, that was because, you know, that was my second love. And, you know, um, and so the defining feature of a first love is not just that it was the first, but that it, that it ended or that it, if it not ended, it changed. Uh, there's a transience to the notion of first love. And many of us in our lives do experience something like a first love. It's, and if we haven't experienced it, we are familiar with people who have experienced something like that, or we've encountered the notion. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, this idea of a kind of almost universal, universally available feeling, even if not you know, everybody's had a first love, uh, but universally available to our imagination. Uh, it, it was for me very interesting to imagine um, it is a migration. You know, how does the love story of a first love migrate from into becoming a love and then into becoming something else? And along that journey of migration, and it occurs in a first love, um, what form can it take if, um, you know, if two characters, if two people discover that their destiny is not necessarily to spend all their time together? Uh, you know, in this situation, what can happen is either you both are miserable and you stay together, or uh, one oppresses the other person and uh, that person is sort of triumphant, the other one is, you know, uh, feeling deeply unsatisfied. Or um, you part. And, and I wanted to see, you know, uh, I wanted to explore a love story where the love was deep enough for the characters to be able to wish each other well to the extent that even if wishing each other well meant not being together, they would endeavor to not harm and in, try, in fact help each other on that part of the journey. You know, um, I guess another way of saying that is I wanted to write the best breakup ever, you know? <laughs> I, mean, uh, it, it, I mean, I'm being flippant, but the, I mean, the idea was, um, and this is, I guess, connected to the Sufi notion of love, which is that um, the word love can mean so many things, but most often these days, love refers to a kind of possessive feeling. Like, if I love you, I want you to be my wife or my girlfriend or my husband or my boyfriend, or if I love your shoes, I want to have your shoes. You know, if I love your uh, car, I want to have your car. I love your house. Um, uh, emotionally, it often means I love you because you make me feel less lonely. Right? But there is a, a, another version of this term um, used less often. But it is, you know, I love you because I wish you to be less lonely. You evoke in me the desire for you to be less lonely. And, and one way which I've, I guess, I, I guess encountered this in my own life is, so moving back to Pakistan, I see my parents and my kids playing. Uh, I see my, my dad and my, my daughter, his first grandchild, playing. And my father has, you know, lost his brother recently. He's lost his best friend recently. But he's watching his daughter learning to ride a bicycle, and he's saying, oh, we've got to change this, you know, play so that there can be a bike path, and we have to, you know, figure out, like, um, you know, this, this tree house that she really wants, and like, you know, should there be like, like how should we get up in that tree house, and how can it be built? And he's imagining the future with a kind of excitement, like, oh, what about when she learns to do this, or what about when she learns to do that? Um, why would somebody who's quite old look at the future and see it with a kind of excitement and hope? Because he loves his granddaughter, and her future allows him to experience the future in a hopeful sense. He doesn't think he can possess her. He doesn't think that he will be there for her entire life journey, right? His love for her is such that it's her journey, and he is wishing her well on it. And that does something for him. That kind of love, I think, is very um, powerful for us in its potential to help each of us uh, uh, 
because it is about moving beyond the self. And uh, it is not about possessing. Um, it is about sort of transcending in a way. And, and so, and so um, the love story of Say the Nadia was my attempt to render, I guess, that kind of love. Uh, and, and I wanted to see you know, how I might express it. So with that point on universal, selfless, Sufi love, I think we'll turn over to our uh, student questions. Hi, my name is Ruby. Um, uh, my name is Ruby. My question is about the phrase, we are all migrants through time. Um, this is meant to universalize the migrant experience, and if this is so, does this risk flattening certain migrant narratives that might deserve more attention? Is so the second part of your question? Uh, it, does this risk flattening, flattening certain migrant narratives that might deserve more attention? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the notion that everybody experiences loss and in the course of their life loses everything, um, does this in some way trivialize the experience uh, of people who have lost an incredible amount you know, right now? Um, I hope not. I don't think that, that actually what, we're, what, what our objective needs to be is to create a kind of hierarchy of loss. I think it is to make everybody, each of us, more willing to acknowledge the shared loss that being human be involves and therefore being able to have more compassion you know, for others. Um, I certainly don't mean to say that the person who you know, lives comfortably and sort of uh, never experiences any hardship, although I'm not sure such a person exists, um, uh, but let's just say that somebody who lives you know, without experiencing violence uh, and without experiencing hunger uh, uh, um, uh, is that journey the same as the, some, the journey of somebody fleeing you know, devastating violence and, and intolerable hunger? Uh, no, it is not the same journey. But, um, uh, but I don't think, I think the risk is at the moment that we um, uh, are, are emphasizing aspects of, of journeys that actually artificially create barriers between people. And what I mean by that is, so in the novel there are these doors that make people go from place to place, right? But the reality, of course, is that most people fleeing war don't get to go through some magical door and arrive in a new place. They have to risk drowning in the Mediterranean um, on a small rubber boat, and people do drown. And they have to experience incredible uh, victimization at the hands of people smugglers, and they have to witness incarceration you know, at the other end by the uh, quote-unquote you know, immigration authorities. And, um, uh, uh, and this all happens, and I certainly don't mean to say that this is not incredibly important and, uh, and, and, and tragic. Uh, it, it is. But if we focus on that part of the story, which I think we do focus on a lot, what seems to me to be occurring is we start saying, well, I haven't crossed the Red Train on a small rubber boat. You know, I haven't uh, been put in prison. You know, uh, in a camp on the border. This is a different kind of person from me. They're, that's their story. But that isn't their story. The first 30 years of their story was living someplace, and then afterwards is living in another place. And in the middle is this part, which is usually quite short, even if horrifically, you know, violent in some cases. Um, and, uh, and, and we emphasize that small part, and then we say, this is a different kind of person. And then we say, because they're a different kind of person, I can sort of shut them out of my emotional, uh, mental landscape. I think when you remove that part of the story, uh, what, what happens is you are left with, here's a person who felt the need to leave a place and then became a person who's trying to make their way in a new place. And that is something that everybody experiences, right? If, even if it's just coming to college or just leaving your parents' apartment to move into your own apartment. Right? That is, uh, and then this person is no longer a different category of human being, this sort of other. 
there's somebody just like you. Um, and, and I think it's from that position, hopefully, that we will be better, away, uh, better able to chip away at the kind of uh, seeming uncaringness towards such people. Um, uh, uh, that might not be right, but that's what I, that's what I think. I think, that, um, I think that it is more useful to show that, um, to allow the reader to see reflected in a character they thought wasn't like themselves, a lot of themselves, um, and allowing them to inhabit that experience. Um, so yeah, I, I would hope that it doesn't trivialize uh, that story. But, but also, the other part of it is, you know, there's seven billion of us taking our own cuts at these stories, right? And so mine is this particular cut, but there are other cuts. We each need to tell our stories and to say it our way. And uh, I certainly don't intend my book to be the definitive book on migration or really, you know, it's just here's a story that I wrote on this and here's what I was thinking. Um, it doesn't mean to crowd out other, other stories. And, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I think um, it is not trivial uh, uh, when we consider just how painful loss is in human life. It's not like uh, we're comparing, I'm comparing a refugee or a migrant to some small loss. What I'm, I think, trying to compare it to is the total loss of what happens in a human life because by the end of it, you lose everything. And, 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 and that oceanic loss, I think, is appropriately compared to the kind of loss that people experience when they are refugees. But, but certainly there can be more than one opinion about that. Hi, my name is Chris, and I just want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your insight tonight. Um, the novel contains uh, scenes of violence and dehumanization, um, such as the death of Saeed's mother, or um, even the young men who are playing soccer with the, with the human head. Um, and you use uh, long sentences that are presented in a matter-of-fact way and without much emotional content. I was hoping you could share, um, you could talk and discuss about your, your choice of using this narrative style and how it works within the novel. Well, I think that as far as averting one's gaze from violence is concerned, like clocking it and then kind of looking away, I, I guess I picked that up from this is how people in Lahore seem to respond people I know seem to respond to these kinds of things. So there'll be a big terrorist attack or somebody that one knows is you know, assassinated or something terrible happens, right? Um, and very quickly, people want to act like things are normal. So you don't go to the market for a couple of days, you, you, know, you freak out a little bit, and then you're like, no, 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 I mean, it's all going to be fine, and you just carry on with your life. Uh, when the stakes are really hard, high, um, it is it is much more compelling to sort of just not look at the terrible stuff. That's one of the ways in which I find almost journalistic accounts tend to be different from lived experience in places where levels of violence are, are relatively high because um, in journalistic accounts often uh, focus on the violence and sort of relay that violence back to where the journalist is reporting to. But, but people living in a place are most often desperate to just live a normal life. Like, I want to get my groceries, I want to pick up my kid from school, I don't want anything to happen, I'm not going to think about, you know, this uh, motorcycle parked next to my car right now, I'm not going to think about, you know, the rumor of, you know, people wanting to shoot school children, uh, uh, I'm not going to think about the rumor that there's suicide bombers in town, like, I'm going to blank that stuff out and just go about my regular life, right? Um, uh, I imagine it's a bit like you know a surfer in California. It's kind of hard, I suppose, to be a surfer in California if you spend your time thinking about the fact that there are great white sharks out there and one of them is going to chomp on you, right? It's just it's almost like to go about the thing you want to do your life. Um, for other people, that predicament is the predicament of danger that you're in. For you, there's almost a desperate attempt to if not pretend the danger doesn't exist, to not spend too much time staring at it or thinking about it. Because it's paralyzing. You know, once you start thinking, 
what if the Taliban takes over? Like, how do you get out of bed and go to work in the morning? It's very hard. So the novel stance towards the violence that occurs is a bit like that. It's what I've tended to see around me. It's acknowledged, and then we move on. But I think in doing that, that doesn't minimize the effect of, of the violence. I hope that actually it makes it much more potent because um, the reader feels uncomfortable moving on. You know, if Sayyid's mother dies in the middle of the sentence and the sentence ends on something else, that doesn't feel right. But the situation isn't right. And the world's regard for the situation isn't right. We are moving on with our sentences, even though at this moment millions of people are facing death on our planet. Right? Our sentences are just continuing just fine. And so um, that, that, uh, that stance is, is hopefully uh, intended to provoke a kind of response um, which, uh, uh, which uh, excavates out the, the meaning of the violence in a world and a context where we are often trying to look away, either because we're there or because we're not there and we don't want to do anything about it. Um, now, as far as sentence structure is concerned, I think that, uh, um, you know, we, uh, I once took a writing course with Toni Morrison in college, and, and uh, she said that, um, uh, you know, that, that as a writer, you need to keep the reader a half heartbeat ahead of the action of, of, the, of the prose. Um, and then she explained, and she said that, well, um, they shouldn't know what's coming next, but after it happens, it should, have, it should feel that it was inevitable. And I think we writers spend an enormous amount of time trying to do that. And how do you do that, right? Um, you do that through imagery. You do that through various kind of tonal shadings that you bring into play. You do that. Um, there's an entire set of stuff happening above and below and on either side of the plot, which is signaling and setting up things before they occur. You know, um, uh, each, each, uh, uh, each movement uh, has hopefully been developed in a way that, that by the time the reader encounters it, it does have that feeling. And of course, we writers who are not Toni Morrison, you know, fail at this more often than we succeed, but I think many of us are trying, right? I think writers, writers all, almost all writers probably try to do this in their own way. And um, and one of the ways in which we do this is through cadence and through language and through you know, the, the structure and rhythm of, of, of sentences. And, and there's a reason why um, sermons and magic spells, you know, incantations, have a kind of rhythm to them. Uh, they set up rhythms, right? Like school kids in Pakistan encounter Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, right? Why? Um, not because morally, you know, uh, uh, he was right. Of course, he was right morally, but many other people uh, uh, had seen that, you know, this is a complete injustice of, of racial inequality. It wasn't that the moral argument was new, um, nor was it like the logical presentation of what he said, um, uh, nor was it even appealing to the value system of those in power in the process of making an argument for liberation because people like Gandhi, et cetera, had made similar uh, appeals in nonviolent movements during the you know, anti-colonial struggle. So Martin Luther King wasn't the first to do this. Um, it, the speech is powerful above all because of its sentences. And its sentences are powerful because they set up rhythms. And those rhythms work by creating an expectation of sound that comes next. And then a word falls in, which is the word demanded for by that rhythm. And when you hear the word, like when you're listening to music, that note is the correct note that was summoned forth by the notes that came before it. This word is the right word summoned forth by the rhythm of the sentence that has come before this word. And so you accept the word. And when you accept the word, if the word is saying something that you otherwise politically, morally, are feeling uncomfortable with, you've still accepted the word. The sentence sounds right. And the word has become inevitable. And so hearing that speech, the cadence and the sentences of it set up a capacity for an audience that perhaps wasn't entirely comfortable with what was being said to take it on board. 
And, and so in Exit West, I guess what I was trying to do was to write a novel that was in its own way a kind of incantation or sort of magic spell, summoning forth this new kind of word, world. And, uh, and, and these sorts of sentences, incantatory sentences, um, that build and set up certain rhythms, uh, for me was a way to put words before the reader that the reader might not necessarily agree with, but once the sentence the sentence kind of demanded the word, um, the word felt inevitable. And when the word felt inevitable, the reader was willing to entertain the idea that the sentence contained. And, and that really is the reason you know, that the sentences in this particular novel are, are the way they are. Hi, um, my name is Dolores, um, and I'm wondering, uh, do you believe that we have been desensitized to tragedy? And in particular, how does social media affect the, uh, our ability to feel the pain of others? Um, I think uh, social media is, is, is you know, very weird. Um, I think social media, I mean, there's different forms of social media. Let's take a Facebook feed or like an Instagram feed. Um, I think these, as distinguished from like a Twitter uh, kind of a engagement, um, Facebook uh, in particular, but also Instagram, you know, it changes our relationship to time. We commence to rewrite our own past. You know, we start authoring our past. Uh, we present our past in the way we would like it to be. And we uh, sort of uh, bring forth a kind of fictional, authorial shaping of our story. But then, we don't just leave it sitting there. We engage with it. We pop up a picture from high school and we start commenting on it. And then, not only are we sort of uh, authoring a kind of fictional past for ourselves, but we are in the present moment living in an engagement with that past that is, you know, maybe unprecedented, where a bunch of us are talking about this thing that happened in the past in a photo that has been created and presented in a particular way. Um, and uh, I mean, that is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. It's very interesting. You know, it suggests that. Uh, I mean, earlier tonight we were talking about the sort of fictional nature of the self. Um, that fictional nature of the self is, is expressing itself in a desire to fictionalize what happened to the self, the story of each of our lives, and then to spend time playing in each of those stories. In that sense, almost like novelists and readers, you know, that we're invited to a world of make-believe, and then we're going to spend time like hanging out there, making comments, liking, posting stuff, doing whatever. Um, now, uh, what is the consequence of this? I don't really know, but, uh, but I think uh, the, it, these, these engagements have been designed uh, intentionally in profoundly addictive fashions, right? I've had a roommate who's a heroin addict, and I've tried to take my iPad from my kids. And uh, it is remarkably similar, you know, the kind of withdrawal um, that a six-year-old has when you take their device. I mean, if my son could physically beat me, at times he would. He, in fact, even tries, uh, even though he luckily can't yet. And um, uh, I mean, the, the nature of the addiction is, 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 I think, obvious to anybody who sees what it's like to take a device, even, you know, from my own wife or, or her with me, if I'm like, texting a friend or on WhatsApp or whatever, uh, and, and she's like, oh, come on, you know, let's, let's be in the moment. And I'm, I have this like snappily, like, you know, like, you know, my initial reaction is, is very um, golem, you know, when somebody's taking my ring. And same with hers. And then we both reflect and say, why the hell do we feel that way, act that way? That's very silly. It's not silly, it's being designed. Um, the bigger question is, to what extent can we accept the authorship of modes of uh, engagement that we are going to engage in as human beings, um, can we accept that authorship being limited to a very small group of people operating with a very small set of metrics in an environment that encourages monopoly um, and, and profoundly shapes our lives? 
I think we can't really accept that, actually. It is sort of our job to jointly author the future instead of it being authored and for us. Um, kids in the playground play make-believe. There's not one person in San Francisco who says, okay, everybody today play make-believe like this. Um, and so, and so I, I think um, re-establishing each of our own individual shaping of what this social media future looks like is essential. And, uh, uh, and it's so far away from what we have now, right? I mean, it's, it's supposed to be all, all about two-way communication, broadcast yourself. Um, but on whose platform, right? Uh, why isn't it two-way about, you know, shape your own platform, um, design your own economic ecosystem, uh, uh, make your own uh, 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 privacy domain? I mean, that's not what we have. So, so I think um, uh, the potential is interesting, but I'm very, very suspicious of, of the way it's being presented to us and, uh, and the addictive nature of it. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty suspicious uh, of, of, of the way it happens. And that's why I'm not really on it. I don't really use social media in that, in that sense. Um, I don't condemn it for other people, but uh, it's like any drug. You know, you decide for yourself if you think you can handle it and if it's good for you, and if you don't uh, think you can do so, then stay away. If I can just follow up with that question. Um, on this point of social media and, and the, the getting back to the mediation of time and space, mm. which I think this relates to, how does, how does this ultimately affect human intimacy, right? Because what we see is people being brought closer together, but if we were to go back to the sort of the main protagonists in the novel, they ultimately drift apart. Would you say maybe just a few words, just following up on that? Yeah, I mean, on human intimacy, I, I mean, one thing about this is in the novel, this shanty town appears in Marin, you know, because, because north of San Francisco, there are these hills which could hold millions of people and would hold millions of people if they were next to Lahore or Caracas or Sao Paulo or Lagos. Uh, but there, of course, they hold very few people. And... Um, uh, uh, and it's interesting, right? You have these economies which there's a desperate need for workers. There's lots of work, and people just aren't allowed to be there. Um, that's very interesting to me. Uh, and so, you know, authoring a shanty town next to San Francisco, in a way, I suppose, is my way of giving a little bit of the future back to the folks who think that they're giving the future to us. Um, but as far as, as, far as uh, um, you know, intimacy is concerned, that the danger we face is that um, we imagine that there's this thing called machines, right, and that they are separate from us. Uh, but of course, the machines come from us and they are increasingly merging with us, you know, whether it be social media or your phone. And soon you will have something inside your body that, that functions in a similar way and will be, you know, jacked into some kind of uh, uh, networked uh, uh, environment. Um, and then a big question will arise, right? It's sort of, we imagine that it'll be us or the machines and you know, what'll happen and et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to face uh, a very big challenge, which is you know, to what extent do we actually exist the way we think we do, right? We might not exist the way we think we do and we might quite naturally elide into kind of a human machine joint existence um, that very rapidly becomes more and more machine-like. And already, I think we're seeing the beginnings of this. When you talk about intimacy. Um, uh, you know, I think we're seeing a kind of binaryization of so much discourse, politics, communication, you know, success, uh, mega success, failure. You know, rich, poor. You know, red state, blue state. Um, there's a kind of binaryization of, of human life that's going on, and you know, of course. If we are going to merge with our machines, the more binary, in a way, we are, the better, right? Uh, the less gray space there is, the easier it is for us to merge. So um, uh, human intimacy doesn't exist in a domain of really one and zero for me. It's, 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 um, it's all the messy stuff that is what the intimacy is about. Um, I, I worry that as we are being conditioned to integrate better with the machines that we are giving birth to, um, that much of what we consider to be human intimacy 
uh, will not flourish uh, in that environment. And maybe we won't miss it. I hope that's not the case. Um, or maybe we will do something about it. But, um, uh, but in a sense, the, you know, in, among the many power imbalances in our world, perhaps the one we should be most concerned about is the power imbalance between folks who are authoring this future for ourselves and a political economic system that supports the authoring in this way. And where that is taking us, um, I'm not thrilled with where it's taking us, to be very honest. Uh, but I don't know to what extent citizens around the world have much say in it at all. Uh, and that, I think, is something that is very important to engage with. Uh, uh, not because you know the Terminator will come and kill us all, um, but because uh, uh, human, human life could be, uh, at least for the romantics among us, um, much less appealing. Then again, I could be wrong, and it might just be that, you know, we will experience a degree of intimacy with uh, a, a software program that understands who we are in a way better than any human can, and that, you know, for the first time we'll truly be understood, and it will be, you know, kind of incredible... A union and the Sufis in the heavens will be applauding from above saying at last somebody understands what it is to love uh, because we'll be jacked into the perfect AI uh, uh, partner. Um, it's possible, uh, but I'm, I'm wary of it. Can we do two more questions? Right, but we've one from the audience. Hi, I'm Maya. Um, so I'm wondering, Exit West seems centered around experiences of contraction and expansion. Um, do you believe in the concept, or does the book believe in the concept of forward progression, or is of what? Every, forward progression, or is everything cyclical? Wow. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have, I have to think about that, I think, quite a bit. Uh, my instinct is it's probably both at the same time. You know, um, moving around a circle, we can still feel that we're going forward. Athletes do it, you know, in the Olympics all the time. Um, uh, it's, you know, uh, I think that there certainly are cyclical elements to human life. Um, And yet, because there does appear to be a beginning and an end, and because um, we do move in a particular direction, I, I do believe in, in forward, uh, in forward uh, movement. Um, I guess the best way I could say it is I think that individual lives are lived with forward movement, but if you step back and look at all the forward movements, they might appear quite cyclical. It's uh, the best I can offer. Okay, last question. Hello, uh, I'm Shinavar. I'm also from Lahore, so it's exciting for me that you're here. Um, looking at all your novels, uh, I'm touching back to this theme of migration. So I feel like everybody, as you said, is migrating in some sense or the other. Um, I would say Daru and Mod Smoke is maybe looking for some big degree of social mobility for Chinggis and the unnamed you and uh, how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. Maybe it's uh, opportunity, and obviously for Sayyid and Nadia, it's survival. So you talk a lot about migration and moving to a place. But I'm also interested in the people that are left behind. So my question to you is, what do you think the relationship is between, say, migrants and the people they leave behind specifically in terms of what they give up, and what do you think that these characters feel that they owe to the place that they leave behind? Yeah. Um... I do think that there is a real violence uh, in leaving in the leaving behind, um, a, a real emotional violence that's participated in by both people, the person left behind and the person leaving behind. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, when I see my friends who live in Pakistan today, those who have a choice to be outside and are in a very fortunate position where they maybe have studied abroad or could go abroad and have passports, you know, uh, visas. Um, 
there's this anguished position that so many people are in. You know, should I be there? Should I be here? And so many of my friends who are over here have a similarly anguished position, like, okay, I like it here, but should I go back there? Uh, uh, the, the, um, it's, it's certainly a very painful one. And I think for those who, in a way, um, are left, who stay in the same place, while others leave, uh, um, uh, that is a, a, a tragic kind of a situation. Um, but as we get older, I think in life, we find that that is always us, right? That, you know, um, as the older you get, the more people that you know and cared for begin to leave. And, uh, um, uh, I don't think we can ask that people stay. Uh, in some cases, they can't because they are ill or uh, you know, they die. And in other cases, we can't ask them to stay because they must go you know, to find work or support themselves, um, or they fall in love or want to live in a different way. Um, and. Uh, uh, I think um, the real, I guess, the real, the really difficult part of this is when the person left behind also wants to go, right? Because the world we live in right now, at least from in a migration sta standpoint, is often like that, that some people can go and others aren't allowed to. They didn't win the lottery. They didn't... Um, get out in time. Uh, they didn't submit the right refugee application in the right country. And, um, and I think you know, what arises from that is a, a colossal sense of unfairness. Uh, um, I remember Orhan Pamuk wrote this essay after 9-11 you know, where uh, I think he called it the anger of the damned those who feel they've been left behind. Uh, he was speaking of, of globalism and its winners, but also I think of those who have been left behind in places that they feel they would rather not be. Um, but for me, uh, the solution to this is not to create a world where nobody leaves, um, but to create a world where everybody can. And, uh, and I do think that you know, a few centuries hence, we will live in a world where the notion that somebody cannot move uh, because of the place they were born will be as abhorrent as the notion today that somebody uh, should be a slave because of the color of their skin. I think that this is just not a sustainable position, um, that somebody's fundamental rights on this planet are determined by the geographic location of their birth. That, that will not be uh, sustained. It's not sustainable. Um, and so eventually, I think, as human beings, we will live in a planet where people can move. Uh, also because denying them the movement, those left behind, denying to them what those who have left have, uh, requires terrible violence to be inflicted in this world. And those who inflict the violence, you know, they lose their own humanity along the way. So, so I think this aspect of it, the notion that uh, uh, some people get left behind and some can move uh, will hopefully diminish. Uh, but, but even so, there will remain those who are less well off, those who are better off, um, and those who feel less able and more able. Uh, but but I, each of these issues for me just resurfaces um, you know, the, uh, the profound need for a greater sense of compassion uh, in our in our world, um, and and uh, and that those of us who have migrated, I count myself among them. Uh, I think certainly have uh, a, a kind of moral obligation uh, to insist that others also have the same right, uh, and that means, of course, the ancestors of everybody who doesn't currently live in the Rift Valley in Africa. All of them migrated. Even the ones who do live there 
moved around and came back. Which I, th mean, I think means that we all, you know, kind of have to demand for everybody the rights that we and our ancestors have enjoyed. Uh, yeah, that's what I'd say. So I, I'd, I'd like to just step in at this point, and I'd really like to thank Mohsin Hamid for such a wonderful evening and such a great conversation. I want to thank Arash for pulling together such great questions and for our audience and our students who so dutifully pulled together questions in their discussion groups and got so excited about them and wanted to be here. So could we please now just give a round of applause for our audience. Thank you. Thank you both so much, which was a terrific book this year, and we're just really thrilled to have you here on campus today. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.